Hello there, today we're diving headfirst into the captivating world of workspace optimization. If there is one place you should pay attention to if you're trying to increase your productivity, it's probably your workspace. Let me explain. It's not just a physical environment, it's a reflection of your mindset, work habits and overall efficiency. By optimizing your workspace, you create an environment that inspires creativity, enhances focus and fosters a sense of organization. It's like setting the stage for your best performance. A clean canvas ready to be painted with your achievements. Your desk can either be an extremely helpful tool for achieving your goals, or it can be a burden slowing you down and drastically decreasing your efficiency even at most productive hours of your day. Keeping it adjusted to your needs is quite a responsibility. That's why I created this video in the first place. What if I used modern research in order to find out what will work when it comes to workspace optimization and what will not? Sounds like a plan. And I believe it is indeed great. As usual, I spent a considerable amount of time digging it all up, so enjoy this video. And if you want to ask something or leave a feedback, maybe critique, that's great. I'll reply to your comment as soon as possible. Chapter 1. Light. And hold on, I'm not gonna tell you to simply use a lamp. Let's break this topic into small, chewable bites. Firstly, what is so special about light? Light obviously is an essential element of our environment, enables us to see the world around us. But there is another massive reason why it may be one of the pillars of your productivity. Yeah, you heard it right. It plays a significant role in our overall well-being and efficiency. From natural daylight to artificial lighting, the quality and quantity of light we're exposed to can have profound effects on our cognitive functions, mood and performance. And there is a reason why I mentioned a distinction between daylight and artificial lighting. They are quite different and you should be aware of how, but we'll return to this topic a little later. So what was that crucial role I was talking about? Adjusting your circadian rhythms. Basically the time at which you go to sleep and wake up. Light serves as a crucial regulator of our internal biological clock, influencing our sleep-wake cycles, hormone production and overall circadian rhythms. Exposure to bright natural light in the morning helps synchronize our internal clock, promoting alertness and productivity during the day. Have you heard something about blue light? Some people demonize it and think that it's bad for your health and productivity, but it's not that simple. Yes, exposure to low levels of blue light, as well as bright light during night or before bedtime, may disrupt the circadian rhythm with severe or general health implications. That's probably why some people think it's generally bad. But the thing is, it is currently considered to have the strongest effect in synchronizing human circadian rhythm. And blue light exposure during daytime is crucial for the vitality of the organisms. Inadequate low lighting, especially like in the blue part of the spectrum, may cause circadian rhythm disruptions. That's why bright artificial lighting with a more blue weighted spectrum during daytime is so important. Light exposure suppresses melatonin, a hormone which is responsible for your feeling of sleepiness, and increases cortisol. It's widely known as a stress hormone. And again, it doesn't mean it's bad and you should always lower your cortisol level. You need more of it at the beginning of the day and less at the evening and night time. Now to the practical part. What should we do? One of the possible scenarios is turning the light on after waking up, but there is even a better solution. Go outside. Let me tell you why artificial light shouldn't be the option number one. Illuminance is the metric that is used to measure the light intensity within a space. It's usually measured in lux, basically the amount of light falling on the surface. And if you're really excited about doing it yourself, it's possible. You can measure it with your phone. It's thought that the luminance in bedrooms is usually from 1 to 300 lux. And what about full daylight? 10,000. Even on an overcast day, it's 1,000. See? That's why it's better to take a brief walk or maybe have a breakfast outside early in the day. And as you might guess, staying in your dimly lit bedroom in the morning isn't the best scenario. Maybe your room is too dark and you can move your desk next to the window. And if your bedtime is close, try not to expose yourself to bright light and maybe use your devices with screen less. Even during daytime, don't use too much light. Moderation is crucial. And this moderation is when you don't blind yourself. Okay, if you're driving, I think you should forget about what I've just said and prioritize your safety. When you need sunglasses and it's a matter of safety, always wear them. Come on. So that was the first massive thing you should pay attention to while optimizing your workspace. This thing was about what you perceive with your eyes. Now let's talk about what you capture with your ears. Noise. In today's bustling and fast-paced work environments, noise has become an ever-present challenge. What does science say about this matter? Can noise negatively affect our concentration? As you might guess, there are some papers that support this idea. Moderate traffic noise levels can influence cognitive performance and concentration. And perceived workload. It's a little painful topic for me, actually. I'm really sensitive to background noise and it can significantly disrupt my work rhythm. I used to live in a place close to a highway and didn't have an air conditioner in my room, so in the summer I would open the window and that was always the moment 
when I was reminded by the traffic noise that there was a highway nearby. But I started using earplugs and they pretty much solved the problem. Evidence suggests that noise in offices also affects focus. I'm always impressed how people can work in such noisy environments where there are so many noises from phones and others. I can't even concentrate in a coffee shop. Not only because of the noise, but also because of lack of privacy and confidentiality. Even if I'm not working on a highly classified project, which I usually do, of course, it still feels awkward. But I suppose it's individual, and some people enjoy working in such an environment. So what practical solutions do I have in my mind? Firstly, earplugs, as I already said, probably very cheap options, and they still work great. I was surprised when I first tried foam earplugs. They completely cut off the noise from the street and even from air conditioning, which caused some troubles for me as well. Second option is noise cancelling headphones. Of course, it's quite expensive to buy compared to earplugs, but if you already have headphones, you can imitate noise reduction by listening to noise cancelling playlists and find something suitable for you. And the last option is to upgrade the place you live at so your walls, doors and windows will allow less noise to enter into your room. But it's even more expensive. Next topic, body positioning. Have you ever heard the fact that a standing desk is better than a sitting one? Actually, that's not a fact. Standing workplaces aren't perfect as well, and there are some health complications in this case. So you know what's the solution? To combine both. You don't have to have a more than expensive desk for this. For starters, I recommend experimenting with your books and boxes to create an elevated surface for your book, laptop or whatever you're using at the moment. Of course, it's rather a temporary solution, but there is no harm in trying, as they say. Or if there is no way you're gonna do this or buy a table suitable for this, you can at least add small breaks, take a brief walk. Speaking of breaks, let's move to our last but not least part. Take breaks. Sounds simple, but it's rather not. Why don't people do it? There is a paper which studied this problem. Here is what they found out. There turned out to be seven reasons why people skip breaks. Firstly, workload. They thought that they should finish their task first. Second reason was momentum. Participants thought that they would lose momentum if they took a break. To be honest, that's usually my problem. If I have a huge task, I feel like I shouldn't waste my time and lose momentum, but that's quite delusional sometimes. There are studies which show that micro breaks can improve your productivity. And even if it feels like a waste of time, maybe it's not. And the third one, expand ins. Participants indicated not taking a break to reduce the amount of work needed to be done in the future. This also sounds so much like me. There were some other reasons, but they were less common. So what types of breaks can you arrange? Firstly, lunch breaks. I like changing context and grabbing a plate of salad in the kitchen, but according to the study I've mentioned, they weren't as effective as other ones. The best thing for me is going outside. This way I can really forget about my task for 10 minutes and enjoy the scenery. And the third type of break that comes to my mind is a brief mindfulness practice. Meditation was shown to have some benefits if done for some time consistently, so if you really want to see them, you should do it regularly. It seems that this applies pretty much to everything, but still wanted to remind you. Now let's sum up. In a world where destructions seemingly lurk around every corner, it is imperative to create a workspace that supports your goals and aspirations. Workspace optimization is not just about rearranging furniture or decluttering, it is about cultivating an environment that fosters productivity, enhances well-being and showcases your professionalism. So take a moment to evaluate your workspace. Remember, it's not just a physical space, it is the launching pad for your success.